Welcome to our lecture on simple linear regression. In regression, we're going to have something called a dependent variable. That's the y variable. And that's expressed in terms of its relationship with the independent variable, x. Just keep remember, it's very important to remember, x is called the independent variable. And it, that's the one that's supposed to affect the y, the dependent variable. And the way to remember that is y depends on x. So y is dependent. Now, in simple regression, you only have one x variable, one independent variable. And that's what we're going to learn in this course. In more advanced courses, you're going to learn what's called multiple regression. We have several independent variables. So you'll have an x1, an x2, an x3, etc. And it, it, we're still trying to do the same thing. We're using the x variables to predict the y variable. So it doesn't matter whether it's one or many. What happens, though, is you're not going to be able to do this by hand if you have several x variables. It gets very complicated. It's a matrix. But the computer does a few. So again, we're going to be studying simple linear regression. And we're going to see whether x and y have a linear relationship. And what is that linear relationship? I know we've talked about this in earlier lectures, but you could hardly blame me for shamelessly promoting the notion that uh, if you study more, your grade on your quizzes might be better. Uh, here's an example just to show you what regression is all about. A researcher wishes to determine the relationship, if there is one, between hours studied and the grade you get on a quiz. In regression now, there's something new we didn't have in correlation. Uh, we're going to be um, coming up with a mathematical equation uh, where um, you're, the variable you're studying, in this case, we want to know what goes into grades, is going to be the outcome variable, the y. And um, the uh, variable that goes into it, that's independent and that it affects that the the y variable is called x and uh, we have to know which is x and which is y in correlation we were just looking at association so over here we clearly label our studied is x grade on quiz is y uh, this is a small example you'd never do regression with only five pairs of data but this is just um, an illustration um, we've got five students. Um, the first student studied one hour, the next one two hours, three hours, four hours, five hours, and the grades on the quiz were marched along with that at 40, 50, 60, 70, and 80. Now let's see what we do using regression to analyze this data. In this unusual example, as you can see, when you plot your points, every uh, data point is an XY pair. Every single one of the points f falls on a straight line. Um, this is easy. It doesn't happen in real life, but it's nice to look at and understand what's happening. And if you remember from the correlation lecture, this means that, especially since that's clearly a positive line, the slope is positive, the correlation coefficient R is equal to plus one. And the coefficient of determination, r square, is 1 or 100%. And what that means is that the, uh, for the coefficient of determination, the uh, proportion of the variable in y, variation in y that's explained by x is everything. There's no other variation. There's nothing else going on. Uh, our study is the only thing you have to look at if you want to predict someone's uh, score on an exam. Uh, and if the line is what looks like this, you don't even have to ask questions. Obviously, it's easy. Just extend the line to x equals 6, and it's easy to predict what y will be. Uh, this doesn't happen in the real world. Um, it's a nice example to learn from. Later on in the lecture, we'll see things that are a little bit more realistic. But let's move on and see what else regression can do for us. Everything you see on this slide, you would have learned uh, in high school or middle school um, when it comes to um, the equation for a straight line. That's, that's what you would have learned and when you would have learned it. If you need a refresher, uh, go to our website uh, in bootcamp.
there is a section on plotting a straight line. So in this case, um, you can since this is so easy, all the points are on the line, it's easy to, to figure out that the line itself is 30 plus 10 times x. That's how, that's how you uh, predict any value of y. Um, we'll get to y, what y hat is, but basically y hat just means this is the regression line. This is the point on the regression line. Um, if you see 30 plus 10x and you remember how to plot a line, how to a straight line and what the equation looks like, you know that uh, 30 is the y-intercept, so that when x is 0, for somebody who doesn't study at all and had studied 0 hours for the quiz, uh, their grade would be 30. And then after that, every additional hour studied adds 10. The slope is uh, 10. Adds 10 uh, to the final value of y of the grade. Uh, in regression, um, we call these two um, coefficients uh, B0 and B1. So B0 is what you might have before called um, A. B1 you might have called B. In, if, if you're not doing regression but you're uh, specifically looking at the equation for a straight line, uh, A plus BX, MX plus B, uh, it, it's only notation. Uh, what we do in regression, we have B0 as the constant term and um, that's the y-intercept because if x is 0, y hat is just equal to b0. Uh, b1 is the slope term and it tells you incrementally for every additional value of x how much it contributes to y, to y hat. Um, so you can see right away um, if somebody studies 0 hours they should get a, a grade of 30. Um, and what about the question we had before? If someone studies six hours, what should they get? Well, uh, 30 plus 10 times six is 90, and that would be the expected grade on the quiz, even though it's not within our data set. Now we can see what the uh, regression equation looks like. Y, you need that hat. Remember, don't confuse the Y hat. That's the points on the line with the, the input data, because you have to put input x and y. We call that yi without the hat on it. So y hat i is b0 plus b1x, and as you know, b0 is the intercept, and b1 is the slope term. Why do we need regression in addition to correlation? Correlation just gives you an r. Remember, r goes from plus 1 to minus 1. You get a correlation coefficient, then you can test for a relationship. But if you want to actually be able to predict y for a different value of x, you need to do regression. Or, very important, you might want to know what the slope is. You know, you want to know the change in y over the change in x. For example, in the real world, you know, you might be asked the question like, if I raise price by a certain amount, what effect will that have on sales? Maybe you learn something like that in with elasticity. Okay, that's very important. You need a slope for that. Or if you're in marketing and you say, well, if I add shelf space, that's the X variable, will it have an effect on sales? That's a very important problem in marketing, the effect of shelf space. Well, you need a slope for that. So slopes are important. You can't get a slope just by getting R. R is not a slope. Okay, it actually is related to it, you'll find. If B1 is positive, R is positive. A, they're related to each other, R and B1. And finally, you want to see the scatter plot. You want to line through it, and you can do that very easily. When you draw a scatter plot, you can get a line, and that's the regression line. In correlation, all you're going to know is if two variables are related. That's it. Here we're going to show you what, what you're actually getting when you get the B0 and B1. I remember you've taken a sample. And you took a large sample. You took 100 observations. But, you know, planet Earth is a lot bigger than your 100 observations. If you look at people, you know, you talk about the United States, you have 330 million people here. You're going to sample 1,000 people to get your regression equation. So your B0 and B1 terms are just sample estimators of the true population parameters, beta 0 and beta 1. So keep that in mind. They're estimates. That's why you have to test them for significance. The way to test for significance, which we're probably not going to do in this course, 
but you know you should be, bear in mind you got to do test the slope of significance and there's ways to do that you'll see it on a printout um but keep that that's important to keep that in mind and here we show you with you know your your regression equation sample estimators with a b and a b a b0 and a b1 and then we show you what the real which you don't see unless you were to take like a census and take every single person on planet earth which of course is not feasible and then you have a beta 0 plus beta 1 x1 plus an e an e term that's the uh the random error and again the assumption and regression your null hypothesis is going to be there's no relationship that everything is zero that x and y not related and basically in simple english no regression just x and y just unrelated and, and you can't use x to predict y here we put we plot the uh, again this is a scatter plot and you see the the uh the y and the x and notice you have the observations and you got the regression line through it you can do this with the computer it's very simple with a scatter plot program right and notice that you have these kind of points at your data the original data the x and y points and uh, if you look carefully you'll see actually not one point is on the line some are above but this line is like the best fit line we're going to learn in a minute what it means it's actually something's called the least squares line the line that what does it do so mathematically we'll learn a little bit about this soon is the, it's a, a special line that does the best job and you hear the word least squares so to understand what it means least squares you have to understand what those residuals are notice that some of the points are above so you have a positive residual you might think of residual as a deviation so it's a positive deviation from the line some are below it's a negative deviation and now we're showing you here what you're mathematically trying to do you're trying to minimize the sum of the squared errors sse and again the e is the residuals so you see that sum of the ei squared let me show you what it's equal to it's the sum of yi that's your data that you put in then you have minus y hat squared and we show you what you're doing that formula there sum of the yi minus b0 plus b1 x1 squared that whole thing okay that's the thing we're going to try to minimize and using partial derivatives you can actually derive what's called normal equations and those teach us what equations have to be solved to get the b0 and b1 so if somebody asks you what do the b0 and b1 do they minimize the sse the sum of the squared residuals Again, this E sounds like an uh, error, which kind of is a sort of, it's a random error. So SSE, when you minimize those squared residuals, those deviations, you actually, that, the B0 and B1, you that do that for you, that's going to be your regression equation. And the computer generally does it for you. We're going to do it by hand too, but really in the real world, you use a computer for this. Well, here you see the residuals, you see? It's a vertical line. It's either a positive residual. It's above. The first one is above. So it's positive. The second one is below. And the, the third one is above. The fourth one is below. So you have positives and negatives. Okay. And here's with the definition of a residual. It's yi minus y hat i. See, that's the ei. And basically, again, um, well, first of all, I would tell you about the sum of the ei it turns out that it'll always work out that the sum of the ei is zero so that's why we're going to look at the sum of the ei squared we're going to square those residuals those deviations and uh, minimize it and that we called already sse sum of the squared residuals and um, that's the thing that we minimize okay here's so we're going to give you the steps to do correlation and regression together so you'll get the R and you'll get the regression equation. Generally, we'll give you these variables. You can get it from, obviously, from Excel. The sum of the X, the sum of the, R, the Y, the sum of the XI, YI, the sum of the XI squared, and the sum of the YI squared. Okay, and there's the formula for calculating R. That's the formula you're going to use. And um, um, R, again, is, is going to be plus a number between plus 1 and minus 1. And it's a way to test the correlation for significance. If all you're doing is correlation, you must test with significance to make sure that it's that it's different, significantly different from zero. So that's the first step. So that's how you get R.
we get R, okay, we have R, you might want to square it and get the coefficient of determination. Remember, R squared is between 0 and 1. And that's the proportion of the variation in Y, the dependent variable, that's explained by the independent variable. So it's like, think of it as a proportion. So if you explain, let's say, 60%, uh, if X explains 60% of the variation Y, that means 40% is left unexplained. Okay, now if you want to calculate the regression coefficient, B1, look at the formula. You'll notice the numerator is exactly the same as the one you had for the correlation. And in the denominator, you um, have the same, it's kind of half of what you had for correlation. So you really have all these terms. Everything is there. So it's very easy to get the B1 term. I told you B1 and R are very much related. You can't, uh, they're always the same sign and there's a relationship between the two. Once you've calculated B1, it's very easy to get B0. Remember your input data was, you know, X, I, Y, I. Well, forget the average of those two columns that you put in. So you'll have Y bar and X bar. So B0 equals Y bar minus B1 X bar. And B0 is, again, the Y-intercept. That's the predicted value of Y when X is 0. After you calculate the B0 and the B1, it's important to write out the equation. Always write it out. Y hat, little i, equals B0 plus B1 XI. Always write out the equation. And it's good to know what the, what the X and the Y represent. There are actually th three ways to test the regression or correlation for significance, but you'll see it in the output of, of Excel. So notice A, you can actually test R for significance. I'm not necessarily saying you're going to have to do it, but this is the way you would test it, and there's your HO and H1. Or you can test the slope term, and your HO is at B1 equals 0. And the third way is doing the F tests, which is a, a part of the printout of Excel, and you'll get an F value. We'll be showing you that when we show you the printout. But the important thing is to remember, you do have to test for significance. You want to make sure that the, there's a relationship between X and Y. Otherwise, don't do regression and don't do correlation either. We're going to look at another simple example, five pairs of observations where X, the independent variable, is how much water we use on our crop of tomatoes. And why is the yield? We're looking to see if there's a functional, a linear relationship between those two, uh, more than just looking at correlation. And remember, once again, five pairs of data is nothing. Uh, it's too little, really, to run regression. And most people will not do that in the real world. This is just so that uh, the, the uh, size of the data set is small enough so that we can write everything out and illustrate to you exactly what's going on. You see the, um, the data displayed in a table, um, the XY pairs, uh, where Y is listed first, and then X that matches it, that goes along with it. Um, you know from the summations, you need the sum of the Y, the sum of the X, the sum of the X times Y, that's your third column, the sum of the X squared, and then the sum of the Y squared. So there's a neat, handy little table if uh, we're doing this by hand. It's a, 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 an easy way of collecting all the sums. Of course, nobody does it by hand, but it's a nice way of illustrating what we're doing. Uh, remember the steps in um, regression? Well, here they are all laid out for this particular problem on a single slide. Uh, step one was getting the summations you need. Um, and uh, there we have it, same as on the slide before. We pulled the summations out of the table on the previous slide. Step two was to calculate the correlation coefficient using that nice big formula. It's not difficult, it's just big. And we end up with a correlation coefficient R of 0 0.9903. So there's a positive relationship. Uh, when we go to step three and we take R and square it in order to get the coefficient of determination, we end up with one that's very, very high, a 98.06% of the variation in um, the, the crop yield is explainable by the water, the amount of water used in this particular problem.
Um, step four is to get B1, the slope term, and you see uh, whenever the correlation coefficient is positive, the slope will be positive and vice versa. Uh, so it's kind of like a check to make sure you, if, if, if those are not the same uh, sign, you did something wrong. Um, and we see there's a positive linear relationship between um, the water used and the yield of the crop. Step five is the other coefficient, B0, the y-intercept. Uh, and then finally, you take B0 and B1, put them together into the regression equation, and we have an equation to represent uh, the line uh, that we get in our scatter plot, the regression line. And it's negative 1.3 plus 3.1 times x. Now, let's see what that means. We're going to look at what the meaning of these things are. All right, so we have our regression equation laid out on the top line, and right underneath each term is uh, what it means, okay? Y represents the crop yield or number of bushels of tomatoes that you get. Uh, X is number of gallons of water, the amount of water used. What's the relationship between X and Y? Uh, the constant term B0, negative 1.3, is supposed to be, it's the y-intercept, and as you know, what that's supposed to tell you is for 0x, what will y be? So if you don't water at all, uh, what will you expect for, from your crop? And of course, a negative y-intercept doesn't do anything but help you plot the line, uh, in this, especially in this case. There, there's no way to explain a negative crop yield. We're not going to go back to last year's crop and donate some. Um, so all it is in this case is just a mathematical device um, to draw the line. It, does, it has no meaning, unfortunately. So, sometimes it does, like the previous problem with hours studied and grades, but in this case, not. The uh, B1, the slope term, tells you for every additional gallon of water, how much does that contribute to the outcome, to the number of bushels of tomatoes? And this is meaningful. Every additional gallon of water means an additional 3.1 bushels of tomatoes for your output. On the left side of the slide, uh, we show you some questions that you can answer now that you have um, um, computed the regression equation. Okay. So for example, how many bushels of tomatoes can we expect if we use three and a half gallons of water? Easy. We just substitute 3.5 in the equation where x goes, right? Negative uh, 1.3 plus 3.1 times 3.5 gives you 9.55 as your predicted regression value, your predicted outcome. So that's 9.55 bushels of tomatoes is the answer to the question. Um, of course, what happens if we uh, say, well, what? I want to. I want to put. Um, I want to add 10 gallons of water. How, you know that must be even better, right? Um, it's outside of the the data that we use to construct this regression line, so we don't really know. And in fact, one thing we do know is sometimes you can flood a crop, and that's the danger of extrapolating. Uh, and of course, I know. Yes, we do it all the time but we try not to. Uh, as, and if we do, better to do it close to the data you already have, like maybe uh, six gallons as opposed to 10 gallons. But yeah, there is a danger of, of making a prediction that's outside the range of X that you used to develop the, the model in the first place. Now on the right side, uh, you see what we were talking about, uh, computing the residuals, right? The, uh, you have the y and the x again. Then now, in addition, we have y hat, because remember, y is the original value. Uh, for an x of a one gallon, there was a yield of two bushels. For an x of two gallons, there was a yield of five bushels, and so on. Um, but those points weren't on the line, necessarily. They may have been close. Uh, so we also include the point on the line for each x value. Remember, x is fixed. Uh, X is considered to be fixed, the independent variable or the input variable, and Y is uh, measured, is studied. Um, so for, uh, let's say, one uh, gallon of water, 
we actually got uh, two bushels of tomatoes, the regression line predicts 1.8 bushels, okay? So that tells us uh, where the line is placed inside our data. That also gives us a way of figuring out um, sampling error, the residuals, all right? The deviation E between Y and Y hat is listed in the next column and after that we square it. Why do we have to square it? Very much like what happened when we were trying to come up with a standard deviation. Uh, we looked at all the deviations and added them up and said, oh wait, this doesn't work because some are above the line, some are below the line. Mathematically, the sum has to come out to zero. That's what happens here. Some of the, the uh, residual, some of the deviations are above the line, some are below the line. Mathematically, they're always going to sum to zero, so that's not helping us at all. If we square it, though, we can end up with the sum of squared residuals, or, the, or also called the SSE, sum of squared error, um, which is a, something that's very valuable to us because it tells us something about the inherent variation that's not due to the regression. And what we got was a sum of squared error of 1.9. One thing we know about this, regardless of anything else we might or might not know, is that there's no other line that we could have constructed through the data that would give us a smaller value of SSE, of the sum of the E squared. 1.9 is a minimum um, because that's what regression promises us. It's a least squares or a best fit line through our data. Here you see the um, Microsoft Excel output for the same problem that we just did painfully by hand. You can find anything on this output that we already found. And you can see a lot of it is labeled. Uh, R, the correlation coefficient. R squared, the coefficient of determination. What about the regression equation? Y hat? Sure. Uh, all I need is to find the uh, coefficients, B0, B1, and then I can put them into the equation, which you also see written out on the output, and it's exactly the same equation we got before. In addition, um, I can find information to help me decide if the regression is significant. Um, and uh, for example, uh, the, uh, the F test, uh, the F statistic, um, how do I know if it's significant or not? Right next to it is um, a column called significance F. And you can see that over here, it's 0 0.00115. Um, and uh, what is it testing? It's testing the null hypothesis that there's no regression, that, that X does not affect Y. There's no linear relationship. And H1, the alternative uh, hypothesis, is that, yes, the regression is significant. Uh, with a large F statistic like that, we can be sure that it will be significant. We'll talk more about that later. Um, but one thing you notice in this case, that significance F is P. That's basically the P value you used before when we were doing um, inference. And if you typically work, let's say, at a, an alpha level of 0.05, this is much, much smaller than 0.05. And so um, indeed, there is a significant relationship between X and Y in this example. If you look at the uh, output you get from Excel, you'll see something called an ANOVA table. That's where you get that F value. We'll see it clearer in, uh, in the future slides. But you can go back and you'll see it, but it's a small, a smaller. You'll see a better, better slides later. But basically what you have to realize is what uh, the way we get that F value is we look at the sources of variation and regression. We look at something called the total variation in Y. And there's the formula, some of the y minus y bar squared. That's the total variation in the y, the thing you're trying to predict. In the previous problem, we were trying to predict uh, the yield, the tomato yield. We had a problem we were trying to predict grades. A lot of researchers are trying to predict longevity, how long people live. In any case, it's a total variation in y. And we could break it up into two components, something we call the explained variation, which uh, Excel calls regression. I like to think of it as explained, explained by X. It's the part of the, of the variation in Y that's explained by the X. X is trying to explain it, like our study was trying to explain the grades. We're trying to explain um, uh, 
crop yield, tomato yield, whatever it was, using the amount of water we're using. So there's an explained component that's called uh, that's called regression in Excel, but really explained is another term that's often used. Same thing, and you'll see there's an SS. That's the sum of squares. The formula. There's the formula. So that's sum of squares. The sum of the y hat minus y bar squared. Okay, you're not going to do this by hand. The computer does it for you. And what's left is called those unexplained variation. That SSE. That's the and that we know what that is. That's called in Excel. It's called the residual. So when you get the sum of square residual, that's that SSE. So what is the residual? That's the unexplained variation. That's what X did not explain when it comes to explaining Y. There's a part that's unexplained. And and this is called this is what we do in the ANOVA table. Look at the sources of variation and regression. Eventually that will lead to that F value. What is F? It's a distribution like Z, T. Now you have a new distribution called F. And here we see the same thing again. Now remember the total variation in y. Look at that. If you sum of the y minus uh, y i minus y bar squared, if you divide by its degrees of freedom of n minus one, you've basically got the variance of y. Put a square root around it, and you got the standard deviation of y. So we're familiar with the idea of variation. Okay. So we look at the total variation, which uh, is called total <laughs> in the Excel printout. The explained is called actually just called regression. And there's the formula for it. You're not going to have to do this. The computer does it for you. And then what's left is called the residual in Excel, or it's really just the unexplained variation. Looking at the printout, we had the total variation in Y was 98. The explained, that's explained by X, which is called regression in Excel, that turns out to be 96.10. Again, you don't have to do these calculations. The computer does it for you. So you'll have the explained was 96.10. The unexplained, and we saw that number before, the 1.90 is what's left. Notice additive. These are called sums of squares. And the sum of squares total is equal to the sum of squares, the explained, which is also called regression, plus the sum of squares, SSE, the unexplained. So now that's how we get that. Uh, that's how the computer gives you those sum of squares, 98, 96.10, and 1.90. And R squared is the proportion of Y explained by X. Now, one way of getting it is take the R, which we got before, 0.9903, and square it. And you get 0.9806. Well, the computer does it through this, the means of the variation, the sources of variation. If you take the explained variation, that's how much X explains of Y, and that was 96.10. And the total variation in Y of 98, divide 96.10 over 98, and you get also that 0.98 rounded. So in other words, 98% of the variation in crop yield is explained by the uh, amount of water used. So it's very important to understand what R squared is doing. You can get it from kind of two different ways, looking at the R and squaring it, or just getting it from the printout and looking at the sum of squares re regression divided by sum of squares total, in this case 96.10 over 98, and you get the R squared that way, the coefficient of determination a second way. More important is to understand what is that coefficient determination. In example two, we're once again trying our studied and grades. It's a different set of data, N is seven, seven pairs of data. Uh, seven's better than five, uh, but it's still not really enough. We would really like more, but we're doing this one by hand, uh, and so uh, I'm being easy on myself. Um, this is a quiz uh, where the highest possible grade on the quiz is 15, unlike before. Um, X is our study. Uh, study the grade on the quiz is Y. We're studying gr the grades and what goes into grades, uh, and we're looking to see if the number of hours studied um, determines in some way the value that you get on the quiz. Okay, It's very important to know what variable you're calling x and what variable you're calling y. And again, you could see we could do this by hand if necessary or for whatever reason, um, if our computer and calculate, calculator all broke. Um, and we can get the five necessary summations, uh, which you see laid out over there under each column. And uh, let's uh, move on and, and do the calculations to get the regression equation.
once again, we laid out all the calculations that you need if you're doing this by hand or with your calculator on one slide, uh, steps one through six. Um, step one, we want to make sure we have all the, the sums that we're gonna need, all the summations. We just copied that from the previous slide. And then now we have the formulas that we're going to use these summations in. Uh, for step two, we compute the correlation coefficient R, um, just plugging the numbers into the formula. R is 0.98, so it's pretty high and it's positive. It's fairly close to one, which means, by the way, when we get to it, that the slope will also be positive. The sign on R and the sign on the slope B1 are the same. If we take R and square it, we end up with R squared, the uh, coefficient of determination, and that's 0 0.9604, which means to us that more than 96% of the variation in grades can be explained by our study. Now, that seems pretty high. When we get to the regression, we're going to look to see if it's significant, but it seems like it's going to be, because that's a pretty high number, a pretty high proportion. Step four and step five are basically to get the coefficients so that you can write down the regression equation in step six. Uh, step four gives you B1, the slope term. Um, again, plugging numbers into the formula, you get 1.3214. There's a positive linear relationship between our study and the grade on the quiz. Step five, B0, the y-intercept. In other words, uh, what will your uh, grade be if you don't study at all? And that's 4.5715. Um, do a tiny bit of rounding and write down the regression equation, 4.57 plus 1.32 times x. So for any value of x, we use this equation to predict what y will be, what the grade will be. A little re repetition here. Uh, the regression equation is again written at the top of the slide, 4.57 plus 1.32 times x will give you a prediction for any any, at any value of x, uh, what will the grade on the quiz be uh, as a prediction? Now, we'll explain the meaning of the regression coefficients. Again, uh, B0, the y-intercept, is 4.57, which means if you study nothing, the grade on the quiz will still be, not bad, if, that's, if you're happy with that, uh, 4.57 or thereabouts. And for the slope, it tells you something about change in y over change in x, or in other words, for every additional uh, hour studied, it contributes another 1.32 to your final grade on the quiz. Um, next question, what happens if someone studies three and a half hours? What would we predict for the quiz score? Well, that's a perfect use of regression. Um, and we're saying that three and a half is the value of x that we want to look at. If you plug that into the regression equation, uh, 4.57 plus 1.32 times three and a half, you end up with 9.2. That's a quiz grade of 9.2 um, or thereabouts. Let's look at the Excel output for this problem. Um, you can see uh, indicated where to pick up all the things that we worked so hard to compute on the previous slide. Um, R, 0.98. R squared, the coefficient of determination, 0.96. Uh, the intercept, that's B0, is 4.57. The slope, which Excel somehow labels x variable 1, but we know it's the slope, is 1.32. So if we want to write out the regression equation, we could do it from those. But before we do that, let's first look to see if this regression is significant. How do we know if it's significant or not? We look at that circled value significance f. It's a tiny, tiny, tiny number. Um, that's the, the uh, probability of getting the sample evidence or more extreme uh, if the null hypothesis is true. So it's such a tiny probability, so clearly, the null hypothesis that there's no relationship between x and y is not true. There is a linear regression and it's significant. So the answer is yes. Um, well, now we want to write out the regression equation. Uh, we pull that by looking at the coefficients and it's the same as before. 
y hat is equal to 4.57 plus 1.32 times x. Um, what's the proportion of variation in grades explained by our study? Okay, that's a lot of words, and you have to figure out if you can understand it. There's a lot of um, there's there's some language in in uh, statistics. It's not just math, uh, but basically what you're looking at is the very definition of R squared. R squared, the coefficient of determination, is the proportion of the variation in grades, uh, the y. That's explained by X, our study. Um, so pulling it off the printout, I have 96.14. Um, and then finally, I can ask any question I want in terms of what can I predict for a grade for a person who studies a certain number of hours. We're going to just try 3.5 once again. And uh, we pull the values of, for, our square, for, for Y hat off of the printout. We've got uh, 4.57 plus 1.32 times 3.5. And once again, we get 9.2. The, the grade on the quiz for someone who studies three and a half hours should be about 9.2. This is example three, job performance. This is not unusual, by the way. Industrial psychology, try to they try to relate performance to some kind of other measure, like a test in particular. So here a company wants to see if there's a relationship between some kind of major field test score that they're looking at people who majored in business and they have some kind of score for that. It actually is a real one, which we don't mention here, uh, it's given by the ETS company, but we're, we're making it up by now. XYZ major field score and they're relating it to job performance, which is measured by a team of supervisors and they rate each of these workers on a scale from zero, which means they're a horrible worker, all the way up to 20, that they're outstanding. So remember, each one of these X, Y is one person. So the first person, um, his or her score was a 70 on, um, on this major field test, the XYZ test, and their performance was a horrible six. The last person they looked at, they got a 46 on this uh, XYZ major field test score. But their performance was a mediocre 10. See, one person actually got a 20, and their score was a 90 on this major field test score. Anyway, this is the input data. So you have the x and the y. We have the sum of the x on the bottom and the sum of the y. Well, if you decide to do this by hand, there are all the sums you need. Sum of the x, sum of the y, sum of the x, y, sum of the x squared, sum of the y squared. And so the next step is we get the r. And by now you're familiar with the formula. And notice n is 16, right? That's why you have 16 times 18708 minus 1200 times. You just follow the steps, the formula. We're not asking you to memorize. You end up with a positive slope of plus 0.80. Which, uh, again, you'd have to test for significance. We'll leave that with the F test. Okay, R squared coefficient of determination is 64%. Point 0.8 squared. We explained 64% of the variation in job performance is explained by that using that XYZ test. 36% left unexplained. You know, an industrial psychologist may say, well, let's add another variable. Let's add X2, maybe even X3. But we're just learning simple regression. We just need uh, one variable, X1. That's all we're using. The slope term, again, you get a lot of these numbers are there. We did it from the correlation. So we see the... Um, we see the um, B1 is 11,328 over 47,552. Remember, these numbers are all been calculated before uh, from the sums. And it turns out the slope is 0.238. It's a positive. Again, if R is positive, B1 is positive, R is positive. They have to have the same sign. So B1 is a positive 0.238. B0, using the formula you've been taught, y bar minus b1 x bar, and you end up with a value of minus 2.85. And now I write out the regression equation. y hat equals minus 2.85 plus 0.238x. Remember, you have to remember what the x is and what the y is. We're trying to predict job performance. So y is job, uh, the y is job performance. Now we can see, look at the Excel printout. Now I keep this in mind that when you do the Excel and you do it by hand, you do both, uh, the numbers may be slightly different because Excel uses a lot of significant uh, digits. 
a lot of decimal places, maybe even 10, and you're only doing this, you're rounding to two or three. So the, the answers will be slightly, slightly different. Of course, Excel is much more accurate than what you did by hand, but it's close enough. Okay, first thing to look at is, is the regression significant? Look at that. Uh, we're going to do this on the next slide, too. Look at that value, 0 0.000018. That's a lot less than 0.05. If it's less than 05 and you're testing at 05, even if you're testing at 01, it's less than 0.01. It's less than 0.001. It's a very low number, telling you the regression is significant. The R is called multiple R, and it's close to what you got, 0.80 by hand, a little bit off, but close enough. Uh, it's not a multiple. It just, this program is used for multiple regression, so they call it multiple R. This is just our lowercase r. That's the correlation coefficient, 0.802. R squared is 0.643, so close enough to what we got, a little more than 64%. And of course, the regression equation, notice B0 is minus 2.86675, etc. And B1 is 0.238. Now, keep in mind, if B1 is positive, that tells you R is positive. If this were a negative, now it's not the slope that's negative. We're going to explain all this on the next slide. But keep in mind that you always check. Before you answer the question as to what R is, you got the R, but it could be a negative number. How do you know if the slope is negative? We're going to do this problem now with MS Excel. And keep in, keep in mind that when you do it by hand, you're rounding. The computer does a much better job. It's using at least nine significant digits. So the numbers may be slightly, slightly off. Of course, the computer got it right. You've been rounding what you round more than the computer does. So uh, don't be shocked if the numbers are slightly off. In the real world, you're not going to do this by hand. But this is for teaching purposes. Okay, there's the printout. You see the R. Actually, we weren't far off. It's 0 0.802. You might even round it to 0 0.80. Now, but before you decide it's a plus or a minus, you look at the slope term. And if the slope is positive, R is positive. Okay, now, and also bear in mind that the, since this program is used for multiple uh, regression as well, it's calling it multiple R. This is really just R. You only had one X. So this is just the same as R, 0 0.80233, whatever. Okay, same as the 0 0.80 we got. R squared is close, 64%. We have, the computer gave us 0.6437. The adjusted R squared, don't worry about. That's a mathematical adjustment. If you want to be a little more precise, we're going to ignore that. The standard error, I haven't really taught you, but um, that's actually the square root of the mean square error. It's used a lot in predictions and to create, uh, if you want to learn the margin of error and doing various tests, we do that in the next course, not in this course. The most importantly is, is the regression significant. And I look at the significance of F. Now, the F value, the F is a distribution like Z or T. It's actually related to T. And notice the F value is 25.298. The degrees of freedom are 1 in 14, 1 in the numerator, 14 in the denominator. And from that, the computer can determine the significance, and it tells you it's 0 0.0001, definitely a lot less than 05, so the regression is significant. Again, if that value, the significance, is less than 05, it's significant. Now, as far as the regression equation goes, the truth is, I, I should have told you this. You always look at the significance first. Because if it's not significant, then you've got garbage. You don't talk about anything. You don't talk about R, because R is not different than zero. So really, you should look at the regression first. Oops. This is, um, these are the answers to the questions that could are usually asked when you look at, a, uh, at uh, an Excel printout. Now, again, first thing you got to keep in mind, the values you get from the calculation from, from Excel and what you did by hand are usually not exactly the same. They'll be close. We'll see, you'll see that uh, we got slightly, it was slightly off on the value of B0. Because when you do it by hand, you're doing two, three decimal places. The computer is working with maybe 10 decimal places. And if you have a really super computer, you might be using 20 decimal places. So Excel is more accurate than what you did by hand. So don't worry about these slight deviations from what you did and what the computer is showing you. In the real world, you're not going to be doing it by hand. Okay, the first question, is the regression significant? Yes, you saw that value there for significance. It was a lot of zeros, definitely less than 0.05. And even if you're testing at the alpha of 01, 
<laughs> less than that too by that. Basically showing you this is not the sample evidence. Now the sample evidence could be represented by the R value, or the R squared, or if you did a scatter plot, you can see it, that's your sample evidence. Is that what you expect to see when X and Y are unrelated? Well, you don't expect to see such a high R or R squared or the kind of scatter plot if you did it. You know, it doesn't look like a random pattern to me, right? If you plotted this, you'd see that. Any case, just by looking at the probability, you can see if the regression is significant. The answer is yes. What was the value of B0? Well, the printout showed um, minus 2.87. We did it by hand. We were slightly off. Don't worry about that. The B1 is 0.238. And now I wrote out the regression equation, Y hat, which again is job performance. That's the thing you're trying to predict. It's job performance. So Y hat represents job performance is minus 2.87 plus 0.238x1. Uh, the value of minus 2.87 makes little sense in the real world because that means uh, if you didn't, if your test score was a zero, we're predicting you'd have a job performance of negative 2.87. But the scale that was used by the uh, panel was zero to 20, so there's no way of getting a negative number. So this one doesn't make too much sense. But again, if you had a bigger sample, perhaps remember these are just estimates. B0 and B1 are estimates of the true beta zero, beta one, the parameters. But um, this happens all the time, that you might get a number that doesn't make too much sense for the intercept term. So we'll use it just for the uh, equation. Okay, so you have minus 2.87. The slope term is important, 0.238. Every point on that test score, the XYZ test score, every point on that one, you go up one point, so you go up by 0.238 in terms of the uh, performance score. We might do better with 10 points. You get if every 10 points on your XYZ test, you go up by 2.38 in terms of the uh, panel of, of judges, how they evaluate you, your performance, basically. The main thing is there's a relationship, so we can use this for predicting. We'll do that in a moment. The R, as we said, was 0 0.8023. Before you decide positive or negative, look at the slope. The slope was positive. It's plus 0 0.238. So R is positive, okay? And the, the proportion of the variation of Y explained by X, that's called the coefficient of determination R squared. That's 0 0.6437, about 64%, okay? A little more than 64%, which means that approximately 36% is left unexplained. And finally, what job performance would you expect for somebody with a test score of 65? Plug 65 into the equation and do the arithmetic and there you get your predictions around the 12.6 give or take a little okay so remember 12.6 is a scale that goes from zero if you're the most awful performance in the world all the way up to 20 it's around the 12.6 here are some of the terms that you might see or that you do see um, when you uh, use Microsoft Excel for regression, you will see it also on a a any uh, statistical package that you use for regression. Um, in regression, uh, you can uh, divide the variance, as you know, separate the variance, we looked at this, into the total, um, the total deviation, uh, can be split into the deviation or the uh, variation due to regression and then the variation due to uh, error which is also called the residuals. Uh, the the term SS means sum of squares because same reason as before we square all of these deviations all this variation because otherwise it'll add up to zero uh, and we we use the sum of squares sometimes we take the sum of squares and divide by the degrees of freedom to get a mean square. All of this is very, very, very much like what we do in order to get a standard deviation. The sum of squares is like the variance. Um, the, we divide by the degrees of freedom um, and we get the uh, uh, standard deviation. In this case, what we have is um, S the degrees of freedom for the regression is one, the total degrees of freedom is always n minus one. And so what's left for the residual, the error, is n minus two. Um, SSR is the sum of squares due to regression. Um, SSE, 
is uh, sum of squares uh, due to random variation. Also sometimes called sum of squares residual, which might be a little confusing uh, since regression has an R and residual has an R. SST, the sum of squares total. Um, if you take any of those sum of squares and divide by the degrees of freedom, you get the mean square, mean square regression, mean square error. And if you take the mean square regression divided by the mean square error, that's the F ratio, that's the statistic that's used for testing the significance of the regression. If it really uh, shows a linear relationship between X and Y, or if it's not just not strong enough to be meaningful at all. Um, in addition, if you take the sum of squares regression and divide by the sum of squares total, you're getting the proportion of the variation of the total variation in Y that's explainable by X. In other words, by the regression, since we're only doing simple regression with one X. And this is R square. Um, which we also got by taking the uh, correlation coefficient R and squaring it. So this is just to help you navigate around the Excel output. And this slide will explain a little bit more about the Excel output. What is the F ratio? We look at the uh, sum of squares regression divided by its degrees of freedom, and that's called the mean square regression. A mean square is just sum of squares divided by its degrees of freedom. And if you take the sum of square error, the SSE, the thing that we minimize mathematically, divide by its degrees of freedom, you have the mean square residual. And it can be shown mathematically that ratio of mean square regression over mean square residual results in an F ratio. Again, F is just another distribution, like Z or T. All right, now if X and Y are not related, you'll get an F ratio somewhere between zero and one, maybe close to one. If you just take a bunch of random numbers and pretend they're related, you know, we've done this a few times, I've played with that, and usually I get something between zero and one. It might be a little bit more than one, but generally it's, uh, nothing's going on, it's just random numbers. It's, you're gonna get something close to, uh, you know, close to one, maybe a little bit lower. Okay, so generally, uh, F ratios between zero and one, not generally, always, they're not gonna be statistically significant. Now, if all the points are on a line, then you've explained everything, there's no unexplained, then the mean square regression over the mean square error, you're dividing by zero. Remember, for all the points on the line, there's no deviations, no residuals, so SSE is zero. Divide by degrees of freedom, you still get zero. So the explained over the unexplained is explained over a zero, so you actually get infinity. Now, the computer will not give you infinity. It means the computer will be working forever. I've tried a couple of problems like this in classes, and guess what happens? The computer stops at some point with a huge, stupendous number. It switches to mathematical notation and stops. Otherwise, the computer, you'd burn out the computer. All right, so if all the points are on the line, the F ratio is going to be a stupendous number per, close to infinity. Now, what does it mean when your F value is 30? Okay, just keep in mind that if nothing is going on, your F value should be something near 1, maybe even 0. It won't happen, but... You know, but something between zero and one, okay? If you get an F value of 30, that means your explained is 30 times greater than the unexplained. And that's generally not going to be chance. And that's why your F value is significant. But all you got to do is look at the significance. So don't worry too much about what the F is. But you can keep in mind that it's a, ra it's a ratio of the explained to the unexplained. So um, the higher it is, you're explaining more than you're unexplaining. So let's say the F ratio is 100. That means you explained a hundred times more than you left unexplained. Remember, the, this is always the, the basis of the ANOVA table is explained, explained by X plus the unexplained is the total variation in Y. Now we're going to start doing problems only using Excel. This is the real world. So we have education. How many years of education? We start with somebody who took a sample of people. And uh, there were 12, see observations of 12, 12 people. And one, one of them, the first one had an education of nine years. And now we have his income in thousands of dollars, is 20, which is $20,000 a year, not too much. And uh, we had the two people who had 20 years of education. And one of them had an income of 43,000. The other one had 70,000. We're representing that by a 43 and a 70. Just keep in mind that income is in thousands. And there's your Excel printout. And um, the first thing I notice, it's significant. Remember, that's the first thing you look at. How do I know it's significant? 
First of all, the F ratio is 28.6. <laughs> we did a lot of explaining relative to unexplaining. 28.6 times more explaining than unexplaining. And uh, more importantly, the significance of F is 0. 0.0003, a lot less than 05 or 01. And that's generally what we test that. So right away, I know that we have a significant regression. Okay, and here's the um, uh, regression equation. We're going to have it on the next slide. That y hat, which is income, that's a dependent variable, is 11.02. And I see 3.197 is a slope term. The intercept, again, was 11.02. The slope term is 3. Point, let's call it 3.20. And the r is 0.86. And it's plus, because the slope is plus. r squared is 0.74. And I think that's enough. And we'll do more on the next slide. The regression equation is y hat equals minus 11.02 plus 3.20x, we're rounding, or if you want to write it out, this is better, income equals minus 11.02 plus 3.20 times years of education. So now we don't confuse the dependent and the independent variable. Since B0 is minus 11.02, in theory, if you had zero years of education, you'd make 11.02 times 1,000, or 11, a negative 11,020, a negative income, which probably indicates that your family's helping you or you're on welfare. But somebody who has no education would probably be making negative income. And the slope, B1 of 3.20, what does that teach us? Every year of education, each year increases your income by 3.20 times 1,000, or 3,200. Every year of education is worth $3,200. The correlation of R, it's uh, positive, it's 0.86. It better be positive. More education, you make more income. As a teacher, we hope it's positive. So R is 0.86, which is strong. The highest it could be is 1. It goes from plus 1 to minus 1, and it's plus. The R squared, which is easier to explain, is 74% approximately. So that tells us that education explains 74% of the variation in income. 26% is due to other factors. That means there will be exceptions, and that's why I don't believe somebody will say, well, I know somebody who never even went to elementary school and is making $10 billion, and he was president of the United States. Okay, that uh, <laughs> doesn't prove anything, because we're not saying it's a perfect relationship. There will be exceptions. And that's the unexplained. The, those are those exceptions that everyone tells you about. Or I know the person who smoked five packs of cigarettes a day and lived to the age of 100. Sure, there are going to be exceptions unless there won't be exceptions if R squared is 1, which means R is 1 you know, or negative 1. If R squared is 100%, no exceptions. Okay? And, um, and notice there's a second way to get the R squared. You take the sum of squares regression of sum of squares total. And if you do that ratio, it'll be exactly the same, 0.741. We rounded it to 74%. Two other minor points using MS Excel. The mean square error, which Excel calls mean square residual, is 61.0969. The square root of that is 7.81645. That's called the standard error of estimate. And it's used for confidence intervals. In any case, you'll need this for future courses. The F ratio is used to test the hypothesis that there's no regression. X doesn't explain Y. That's why we need that F ratio. The regression, regression is very significant with an F value of 28.61. As I explained, you explained 28 times more than you unexplained. And if nothing's going on, you should get an F value of uh, roughly 0 to 1 or maybe a little bit over 1. If nothing's going on, you're not going to get much higher than uh, 1. Certainly, once you get an F of 28, it's going to be significant. You explained a lot. And the probability of getting the sample evidence or even a stronger relationship if the X and Y are, are related, in other words, if HO is true, that's that probability, 0. 0.0003. In other words, it's almost impossible to get this kind of data. Remember, the data is represented by the, if you want, let's say, the R squared or well, the scatter plot of the R, but let's go by the R squared. If nothing is going on, you shouldn't be seeing an R squared this high. The R squared is too high to occur if nothing is going on, All right? It's too, it's too strong a relationship to occur by chance. And that's what that probability is showing you, because the HO is that nothing is going on. Is this the sample evidence that supports this? And the answer is the sample evidence is not supporting that nothing is going on. On the contrary, 
the sample evidence measured by the R, the R squared, or the scatter plot, or whatever, is telling you something is going on. That's why we reject HO. When it comes to simple regression, the three different tests that give you essentially the same results. You can, uh, you know, look at the F test to look at the regression. That's the method that we selected and we're using. But you can also test the R, the correlation coefficient for significance. That'll be a T test with n minus two degrees of freedom. Or you can test the slope. That you'll see on the Excel printout. By the way, that's the same as testing R. But again, this is all in simple regression. So you have three ways to test the significance. You're basically trying to see if uh, X has an effect on Y. If they're related or some kind of effect. There's any kind of relationship. But look at the t-test. I'm going to just talk about it. It's on the printout when I'm asking you to do the calculations. HO is at beta 1 equals 0. And there's no slope. Ignore the slope, which means that's how, the, that's how x affects y, through the slope. If the slope is 0, it means x has no effect on y. So that's the same as testing the regression, the simple regression for significance. Well, the same as testing r. As you know, r and the slope term are related. They always have the same sign. It's a relationship. In the previous problem, the t value, this is for education and income, and this is where the, you're doing the test on the slope, where HO is at the slope is zero, you ended up with a t value of 5.348776972, and that's extremely significant. In fact, the probability attached to it is 0.00032416. By the way, you'd get the same t value if you did the t, uh, t test on the correlation, where HO is at rho, the population correlation is there. You get exactly the same t-value. And again, it's also the same as, as the p-value for the f-test. Mathematically, they get two tests give the same result. In fact, f equals t squared, if you want to know. But in any case, it's three ways to test. We've shown you how to do it with the f-value, because when you do multiple regression, you're going to be using the f-test. But uh, it's good to know there's a t-test for the slope. And that t-test, in a simple case, is the same as testing the looking at the f-test. That's why you get the same probability. So testing the b1 term in simple regression is equivalent to testing the entire regression when you only have one x variable. As it says, after all, there's only one x variable in simple regression. In multiple regression, we have a lot of x's. You could do individual tests for each of the slopes. So you'll have a b1 x1, so you can test that one. Then there'll be a b2x2, you can test that. And you have a b3x3, so you can test them individually, the individual variables. But the f-test then will then be for the entire regression. So for example, you have five x variables, five independent variables. Okay, you can do one test on the whole thing with all five, or you can look at the individual tests on the slopes, on the b1 slope, b2, the b3, the b4, and the B5. Here we're going to use the equation to predict how much income would you predict for an individual with 18 years of education. Plug the 18 into the equation. Income equals minus 11.02 plus 3.20 times 18. And that it works out to 46.58 in thousands. So your predicted income, if you have 18 years of education, is 46,580. Of course, there's a margin of error. That's why you want that standard of error of estimate, because uh, if you take the more advanced courses in regression, they're going to teach you about this. There's obviously, a margin of error, and uh, you'd be using that standard error of estimate. And um, it's, since it's not done in this course, we're not going to learn it. But just keep in mind that your answer isn't really 46,580. It's going to be a plus and a minus, that margin of error. In this example, we're looking at hours spent gaming and uh, if it's related to high school average. And the important thing here is high school average, right? Because we want to know, uh, we want to study that variable. The variable we want to study, we always call y. And we want to look at what might have an effect on the why. Why aren't all the high school averages exactly the same? And in this example, the researcher is studying number of hours spent gaming.
22 students were randomly selected. You see the data on the right side of the screen. Um, X is in, in hours, number of hours spent gaming, and Y is high school average. And I'm going to leave it to you to answer the question, uh, why did we call gaming X? And why did we call high school average Y? And um, if you can't figure that out, you might want to go back to one of the earlier problems in this lecture. First thing the researcher looks at is, is the regression significant or not? See where it says the word significance of F? And note that the value for the significance of F is 2.55559 e to the minus 0 0.7. That's called scientific notation. And it means move the decimal seven places to the left. So our significance level is 0 0.000. Anyway, you see it up there. Uh, highly significant. Basically, this is not chance. What we're looking at cannot be explained by sampling error, which is another word for chance. And again, if you look at the F value, F is like a, like the T value, it's related to T. You know, you're explaining 57.7 times more than you leave unexplained, and this is not what happens through randomness. Something is going on, okay? So now we know we have a significant regression. Now we have a right to look at the coefficients, and notice the intercept term is 84.045. We're going to round that soon. And the slope, this is important. We have a negative slope, minus 5.26. Anyway, a negative slope tells us immediately there's an inverse relationship. When x goes up, y goes down. And notice the r. We're going to talk about this in the next slide. Even though Excel says the r is 0.86, you have to know that it's a negative 0.86. Again, if the slope is negative, R must be negative. Do not forget that fact. Okay? Some programs, of course, will show a negative R because R goes from minus 1 to plus 1. We have a negative 0.86 correlation coefficient. The R squared is about 74.275% or around it. You know, the x variable explains 74.3% of the y variable, and the rest will be explained on the next slide. Okay, here are some questions that can be asked based on the Excel output you just saw, right? Is the regression significant? Well, you already know that. Um, the other professor, Friedman, made it very clear on the previous slide. Um, what's the value of B0? Um, the y-intercept, 84.05. What's B1, the slope? And here you know it's a negative slope, negative 5.26. Uh, once you put those in, what's the regression equation? Well, you can write it out. y-hat is equal to 84.05 minus 5.26 times x. That's the regression equation. From the pr printout, we also saw that the correlation coefficient is negative 0.86. It's an inverse relationship. You know that because the slope is negative. Uh, the, um, the, the X and the Y work in opposite directions. Excel has a little problem with giving you a negative correlation coefficient. It's always gonna look positive. So you always have to make sure you take a look at the slope B1 before you decide um, to answer a question about R, the correlation coefficient. Excel thinks that you know this, and we're all geniuses. Uh, what's the percentage of variation in Y that's explained by X? Remember, we're studying Y. We're using X to explain variation in Y. Well, that's just the definition of R square, the, the, the coefficient of determination. And that's 74.28%. Again, just reading it off of the output. Uh, what high school average would you expect for someone who spent two and a half hours per day gaming? All you do is plug that value of X into the regression formula. And when you do that, you end up with a high school average, a predicted high school average of 70.9. A researcher is interested in determining whether or not there's a relationship between ounces of alcohol consumed daily, 
and workplace performance. And this kind of this a lot of companies have some kind of performance measure. This company is measuring it on a 10 point scale with 10 means you're fabulous and zero means you're worthless as an employee. Probably ready they're going to fire you. Okay? So now we want to know and I, you decide which is the x which is the y. Obviously the uh, y variable known as the dependent variable is performance. We're trying to predict performance. That's the thing you want to predict, okay? And we're using alcohol as the independent variable. And we took 14 employees randomly. We selected them randomly. And somehow we got an honest answer to alcohol consumption. Not so easy to get honest answers for that question. And we also have the performance ratings. And notice that uh, the first two employees had ratings, very good ratings of 9 and 10. The last two, their ratings were 3 and 2, which are pretty low on a scale that goes from 0 to 10. Okay, and the next slide will show you the Excel printout. Here you go. The first thing we look at always, always is to see whether this uh, regression was significant. Because if it's not significant, we might as well just throw up our hands and move on. But this is significant. Uh, there's, there's definitely a significant relationship between um, X and Y. Um, alcohol has some effect on the performance scores and um, does it have a positive effect or a negative effect well you wouldn't know that just by looking at the um, R on the uh, output from Excel so first let's look at the coefficients um, B0 is 7.48 B1 is negative 0.1 uh, so yes there's a negative slope there's a negative relationship um, the more alcohol, the lower the performance, and um, R is negative 0.81, which is fairly high, and R square is 6, 0.6609, which means that a little bit more than 66% of the variation in performance can be explained by alcohol consumption. First question, is the regression significant? Well, we saw the significance of F, and it was pointed a couple zeros there. Yes, it's significant. What is the value of B0? That's called the y-intercept, 7.48. It's on the printout. The B1, the slope term, that was negative 0.10, rounded. We write out the regression equation. Y hat is 7.48 minus... 0.10xi, and remember xi is the alcohol consumption. Okay, what is the correlation coefficient? This is important, and we emphasized it in the previous slide, that when the slope is negative, r is negative. So r is minus 0.81. What is the percentage of the variation of y explained by x? That's known as the r squared, the coefficient of determination, and that was 66.09%. So we did a good job of explaining the variation in Y. And finally, what performance would you expect with somebody who consumes 10 ounces of alcohol daily? You plug in the 10 into the equation, right? So you have Y hat, which is the performance measure. You're predicting it now with uh, X is 10. 7.48 minus 0.10 times 10, and that works out to 6.48. And that's the performance score that you'd predict for somebody who consumes 10 ounces of alcohol. The secret to learning this material is not a very big secret. Uh, I've been pushing this practice after every lecture we do. Uh, problems, problems, problems. Practice, practice, practice. Do your homework. If you can't, don't have an instructor for this course, but you're learning it on your own, go to our homeworks page. Uh, go to the handouts page. There are lots of review problems. Uh, do the problems in this very lecture. Uh, the next uh, lecture up is, is a review session, actually, on regression. Now, specifically, it looks at using Microsoft Excel for regression. But you can, the data is there. You can certainly take the problems and uh, use your um, calculators and also do them with Excel. And you can compare, compare the results. Thank you very much for joining us in this lecture.